it's a good thing. This is December the 10th, 2011. On the U.S. calendar. And on the Israeli calendar, the 14th day of Kislev, 5772. And um, I've entitled this one, Heart Change Part 3. So this, and this is going to be the last uh, in this particular series of messages. And I want to start where we left off the last time. Remember me talking about the marathon runner and the fact that if you're training to run a marathon, <coughs> As you begin running, there comes a point in the process where you end up, your body starts feeling like it can't go any further. And so, <clears throat> at that point in time, for a marathon runner, they can't stop. The whole idea of learning to run a marathon is to continue going. And um, so, at that point in time, now, I, I don't, I'm not a marathon runner, so I, I'm just going off of what someone else has told me that is a marathon runner. If, if that person will relax, even if they have to slow down a little bit, if they'll relax, they'll be able to continue going. And they, they'll get what's called a second wind, so they'll push through that feeling of not being able to go any further, and actually will be able to go further than what they were feeling like they could. And each time they do that, each time they push through that seeming barrier and go on, they are increasing their endurance. They're increasing their ability to go further. So, in, and, and I liken that to... Um, you know, the things that we deal with in life that the enemy brings against us, I was specifically referring to uh, temptation, enduring temptation. But it can also apply to just life situations, um, things that we're dealing with. I want to start with 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Verse 7. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10 is what we're going to read. And I mentioned this in my message last time. <clears throat> so again, I want to start with this. says, therefore, to keep me from becoming overly proud, this is Rav Shaul, the Apostle Paul, speaking, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from the adversary, to pound away at me, so that I wouldn't grow conceited. Three, three times I begged the Lord to take this thing away from me, but He told me, my grace is enough for you for my power is brought to perfection in weakness <clears throat> therefore I am very happy to boast about my weaknesses in order that the Messiah's power will rest upon me yes I am well pleased with weaknesses insults hardships persecutions and difficulties endured on behalf of the Messiah for it is when I am weak that I am strong. Now the thing that we need to to make very clear in our own hearts is that in the Messiah we can't ever say I can't because that would not be true. In the Messiah we have the ability according to the scripture to do anything. So we can't say, I can't. What we can say is, I won't or I didn't. But we can't say, I can't. 
Okay? Philippians 4, 13. Philippians 4.13 is a very common passage that people know which tells us I can do all things through him who gives me power. And then in Romans chapter 8 verse 31 through 39 Romans 8 31 through 39 What then are we to say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare even his own son, but gave him up on behalf of us all, is it possible that, having given us his son, he would not give us everything else too? So who will bring a charge against God's chosen people? Certainly not God. He is the one who causes them to be righteous. Who punishes them? Certainly not the Messiah Yeshua who died and more than that has been raised is at the right hand of God and is actually pleading on our behalf. Who will separate us from the love of the Messiah? Trouble? Hardship? Persecution? Hunger? Poverty? Danger? War? As the Tanakh puts it for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We are considered sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are super conquerors through the one who has loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor other heavenly rulers, neither what exists nor what is coming, neither powers above nor powers below nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which comes to us through the Messiah Yeshua our Lord Amen now the thing is and, and while I'm saying this go ahead and turn over to Galatians chapter 2 because that's the next place we're going to read. But the thing is, Yeshua is not just trying to change us. Remember, I've said in the past, there's not any way to transform your fleshly, carnal man and make it better or different than what it is. It is what it is. Okay? It's always carnal always follows after the things of the flesh, after sin. Instead, Yeshua is, so Yeshua is not trying to change that part of us. He's trying to kill that part of us. Okay? Galatians 2, 21 and 22. Uh, excuse me. Galatians 2, 20 and 21. When the Messiah was executed on the stake as a criminal, I was too. So that my proud ego no longer lives. But the Messiah lives in me, and the life I now live in my body, I live by the same trusting faithfulness that the Son of God had, who loved me and gave himself up for me. I do not reject God's gracious gift. For if the way in which one attains righteousness is through legalism, then the Messiah's death was pointless. And if you read on from there, Rav Shaul is dealing with legalistic observance of Torah commands and the fact that it cannot... Legalistically observing Torah commands cannot do anything for you. It can't save you. It can't remove the curse from you. It can't do any of those things for you. It's strictly trusting. And he goes on. 
talks of, talking about trusting faithfulness. So he's comparing legalistic observance of Torah commands with trusting faithfulness in the Messiah Yeshua. Okay? Yochanan Hamat Beal, John the Immerser, or John the Baptist, as people in the United States like to call him, was the perfect example of what is expected of us as followers of the Messiah. How is that? Well, Yochanan, his whole purpose, and what he dedicated all of himself to was number one preparing the way for the Messiah number two pointing to the Messiah everybody remember when Yeshua came along he stopped what he was doing and he said look there is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and he was not, it tells us that when Yeshua came along and began his ministry, that a lot of Yochanan's Talmudim stopped following his disciples, stopped following Yochanan, John, and started following Yeshua. And they asked him if he was okay with that. <laughs> and Yochanan said, by all means, this guy is the Messiah. I don't, I'm not even worthy to untie his shoes. <laughs> okay? And number three, so to prepare the way for Yeshua, to point everyone to him, and then to decrease and allow Yeshua to increase. Okay? <laughs> to get out of the way. Now I want to I want to say something that's very important. It's subtle, but it's important. Yochanan didn't decrease so Yeshua could increase. Okay? He decreased as Yeshua increased. The difference between those two is an issue of control. Okay? Yochanan, if we say that he decreased so Yeshua could increase, it has the idea, the connotation, that Yochanan was in control of the situation. And as he decreased, then it allowed Yeshua to increase. Okay? And which was not the case at all. Whether, whether Yochanan decided to decrease or not, Yeshua was going to increase anyway. Okay? So, in our own hearts, we can't be looking at it in that way either because that means that I determine how much I decrease so that Yeshua can increase. And it can't be that way. Instead, looking back on a couple messages ago where we talked about a brand new perspective where we talked about the vast, the vastness of the universe and how big God is. When we get a glimpse, a true glimpse of the glory of God and the magnitude of God or at least some facsimile of, <laughs> of that. We can't at this point in time really see that completely. But when we begin to grasp just how big He is, how great He is, then we realize that again that we are nothing in comparison to that. We have to decrease. If God is wanting to glorify Himself and magnify Himself and put Himself out there, who are we to get in His way? I mean, we can't. 
I mean, not only can we not actually, in reality, we can't get in his way, but we can't be doing that. We can't be making choices that get in the way of him glorifying himself. If we think that we can crucify our own flesh, then we are foolish and self-righteous yet again. Instead, the scripture says we have already been crucified with the Messiah. It's just a matter of accepting that and allowing that to be true in our lives. And there's something that we really need to contemplate and meditate on because it's something that I know we take for granted. And that is our new birth in the Messiah. We we have been given given concepts of what that means. We've been told what it means to be a believer, how to live our lives as believers, which by the way, what we have been told is not always correct. Um, but do you realize how amazing it is that we even have new life? And what a, what a demonstration of love and grace it is. Now, how many of us would have thought up, would have had the ability to think up what God ultimately did in Messiah Yeshua as an answer to take care of the sin of mankind. We would not have come up with that, okay, as human beings. Who else would have or could have given their life on our behalf? Nobody else could have done it. There's not another human being that could have died like Yeshua for us. And so you have to ask the question, was there any other way? Any other answer for taking care of the situation? And I would say, no, there wasn't. That was the only answer, was Yeshua. Through trusting, through trusting in what Yeshua did, we exchange our body of death for eternal life. Now, again, we, we take that for granted. We just like, okay, that's just the way that it is. No. Think about how amazing that is. Yes. Through trusting in what Yeshua did on the cross, we exchange our body of death for brand new eternal life. Wow. Can you do that by yourself? Can you do that? No. That's not something that we can do. We have been given the opportunity to start all over and get it right. <laughs> because all of us know that until we came to the Lord, we were messing things up really badly. And even after we come to the Lord, we still mess things up really badly. But in the Messiah, we have the opportunity 
and the ability to get it right. If we will. And that's the bottom line. The opportunity is there. The ability is there. It's just a matter of are we going to do it? Are we going to take advantage of, of what has been given to us and not take it for granted? 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 14 through 21. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 21. For the Messiah's love has hold of us because we are convinced that one man died on behalf of all mankind which implies that all mankind was already dead and that he died on behalf of all in order that those who live should not live any longer for themselves but for the one who on their behalf died and was raised. So from now on, we do not look at anyone from a worldly viewpoint. Even if we once regarded the Messiah from a worldly viewpoint, we do so no longer. There if, therefore, if anyone is united with the Messiah, he is a new creation. The old has passed. Look, what has come is fresh and new. And it is all from God, who through the Messiah has reconciled us to Himself and has given us the work of that reconciliation, which is that God in the Messiah was reconciling mankind to Himself, not counting their sins against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors of the Messiah. In effect, God is making His appeal through us. What we do is appeal on behalf of the Messiah. Be reconciled to God. God made this sinless man be a sin offering on our behalf so that in union with Him we might fully share in God's righteousness. Yeah. <laughs> that is just amazing. Yes, it is. So if He has done all of this for us, and if He allows us to share in the glory of the One who created the vast universe, then how can we not do all things for the sake of the good news? I want to close with one last passage. And it takes us back to this metaphor of running that I started off with. The marathon runner. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Verses 23 through 27. Rav Shaul writes, But I do it all because of the rewards promised by the good news, so that I may share in them along with the others who come to trust. Don't you know that in a race all the runners comp compete, but only one wins the prize? So then, Run to win. Now every athlete in training submits himself to strict discipline and he does it just to win a laurel wreath that will soon wither away. But we do it to win a crown 
that will last forever. Accordingly, I don't run aimlessly, but straight for the finish line. I don't shadow box, but try to make every punch count. <laughs> I treat my body hard and make it my slave, so that after proclaiming the good news to others, I myself will not be disqualified. We are running a race in this life. And I know that there are times when we just feel like it's not worth it. We want to quit. We don't want to keep pushing. We don't want to be hard on ourselves. We want things easy. But the people that win races, the people that win boxing matches, the people that win wrestling matches, the people that win are the people that are willing to sacrifice, the people that are willing to put in the time necessary, the people that are willing to beat themselves up and be brutal on themselves in order to win. The people that are half-hearted, that are not willing to sacrifice, they're the ones who lose. It's the same way in our life in the Messiah. You're not going to get where you need to be by sitting on your tuchus. You're going to win by doing what's necessary to win. Even if it's hard, even if you don't like it. Let's pray. Abba, ah, yet again, as we were discussing in the commentary on the Torah portion, your mercy and your patience, your grace, your love is amazing. And even as we look at ourselves and we look where we are in life, where we are in our relationship with you, and we see how sadly we are lacking. We marvel at the fact that you continue to be merciful and patient and loving with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We do not deserve it. But thank you. Father, this message is just, and maybe even more so convicting to me than it is to anyone in this room or anyone who might listen to this on YouTube. I can say I have not pushed through like a marathon runner. I have not trained with the determination that a victor has. I have not been hard on myself like I need to be. <coughs> oh.
But Father, I, forgive, I ask you to forgive me for that. And Father, I pray for myself and for everybody here. Father, that we will not see anything as being too much and too over the top for you. That we will be willing to give up anything and everything. For your sake. For the sake of winning. For the sake of the crown. For the sake of not being disqualified. And Father, it's good to look towards a crown, towards a reward for winning. But I think, and, I, and probably most of the people here would say the same thing. Just to be able to hear you say, well done. good and faithful servant would be reward enough for me. Father, I want to hear those words from your mouth. And so I pursue you with all my heart. Issue his name. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Yeah. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, our Lord, our righteousness, our salvation, the Prince of Peace. Amen.